This is the story of an American girl called Dorothy, who lived in the heart of the country with Uncle Henry, who was a farmer, and Aunt Em, who was his wife. They were very poor and worked from sunrise till dark. In fact, they worked so hard that they didn't have much time to play with Dorothy, and in all the time she lived with them, she never once saw them laugh. It was Toto that made Dorothy laugh. He was a little black dog with twinkling eyes, and Dorothy played with him and loved him very much. But on the day when the story begins, they weren't playing. Uncle Henry and Dorothy stood on the doorstep and looked anxiously at the sky. From the far north they heard a low wail of the wind and they could see where the long grass bowed in waves before the coming storm. Suddenly they heard a sharp whistling in the air from the south and saw ripples in the grass coming from that direction. Uncle Henry called to his wife, There's a cyclone coming, Em, I'm going to look after the animals. And he ran towards the sheds where the cows and the horses were kept. Aunt Em dropped her work and came to the door. One glance told her of the danger. Quick, Dorothy, she screamed. Run for the cellar. Toto jumped out of Dorothy's arms and hid under the bed. And Aunt Em threw open the trap door in the floor and climbed down the ladder into the small dark hole. Dorothy caught Toto at last and started to follow her. When she was halfway across the room, the wind gave a great shriek. And the house shook so hard that she lost her footing and sat down suddenly on the floor. Then a strange thing happened. The house whirled around two or three times and rose slowly into the air. It was very dark and the wind howled horribly, but after the first few moments, Dorothy found she was riding quite easily. Suddenly, there was a big bump and the house stopped moving. Dorothy sprang up and with Toto at her heels ran and opened the door. She was astonished to see that the cyclone had set the house down, very gently, for a cyclone, in the middle of a beautiful country. There were lovely meadows with beautiful flowers everywhere, and birds with bright coloured feathers sang and fluttered in the trees and bushes. But while she stood staring around her, a group of the strangest people Dorothy had ever seen came towards her. Three of them were men, one was a woman, and they were all oddly dressed. They wore round hats that rose to a small point in the centre. When they got closer, the old woman walked up to Dorothy, gave a low bow, and said in a sweet voice, You are welcome, most noble sorceress, to the land of the munchkins. We are grateful to you for having killed the wicked witch of the east and for setting our people free from her spell. Oh, Dorothy listened to this speech in amazement. What could the woman possibly mean by calling her a sorceress and saying she killed the wicked witch of the east? Well, she evidently expected her to answer, so Dorothy said, you are very kind, but there must be some mistake. I, I haven't killed anyone. Well, your house did, replied the old woman with a laugh, and that's the same thing. Look, she said, pointing to the corner of the house. There are the witch's two feet, still sticking out from underneath it. Well, Dorothy looked, and there indeed, two feet were sticking out from under a corner of the house, and on them was a pair of silver shoes. Oh, dear, said Dorothy. Who did you say she was? She was the Wicked Witch of the East. She's held all the matchkins under her spell for many years, making them slave for her night and day, and now they're all set free. When they saw the Witch of the East was dead, the munchkins sent a messenger to tell me about it. Oh, I am the Witch of the North. Oh, said Dorothy, are you a real witch? But yes, indeed, answered the woman. But I am a good witch, and the people love me. I'm not as powerful as the Wicked Witch was, or I should have set the people free myself. Yes, but Aunt Em told me that the witches were all dead years and years ago, said Dorothy. Hmm. Is she a grown-up person? asked the Witch of the North. Oh, yes, Dorothy answered. Then that accounts for it. Grown-up people don't believe there are any witches left, nor wizards, nor sorceresses, nor magicians. But of course there are. Well, Dorothy was very surprised to hear this. Well, who are the wizards? she asked. Well, the witch's voice sank to a whisper. Oz himself is the great wizard. He is more powerful than all the rest of us put together. He lives in the city of emeralds. Well, Dorothy was going to ask another question, but just then she noticed that the feet of the dead witch had disappeared entirely, and nothing was left but the silver shoes. 
the good witch of the north bent down, picked up the shoes, and after shaking the dust out of them, handed them to Dorothy. These are yours, and you must wear them from now on. The wicked witch of the east was very proud of them, and there's some charm connected with them, but I never found out what it was. Holding the shoes in her hands, Dorothy said, I'm anxious to get back to my aunt and uncle. I'm sure they're going to worry about me. Can you help me find my way? Well, the old woman thought for a moment, then gave a sharp whistle and made a noise like thunder. Then she took off her hat, looked inside, and said suddenly, Is your name Dorothy? Yes. Then you must go to the City of Emeralds. Perhaps the Wizard of Oz will help you. But well, where is the City of Emeralds? It is exactly in the centre of the country and is ruled by Oz, the great wizard I told you about. Well, how can I get there? Dorothy asked. You must walk. The long journey through a country that's sometimes pleasant, but sometimes dark and terrible. But don't be afraid. I will give you my kiss, and no one will dare to harm a person who's been kissed by the Witch of the North. And she came close to Dorothy and kissed her gently on the forehead. Where her lips touched, they left a round, shining mark. The road to the City of Emeralds is paved with yellow bricks, said the witch, so you can't miss it. When you get to the Wizard of Oz, don't be afraid. Tell him your story and ask him to help you. Well, the three munchkins bowed low to her, wished her a pleasant journey, then they walked away through the trees. And the witch gave Dorothy a friendly little nod, whirled around on her left heel three times and disappeared. When she was left alone, Dorothy set about making ready for the journey to the City of Emeralds. She went back into the house, took a little basket and filled it with bread from the cupboard and covered it with a white cloth. Then she looked down at her feet and noticed how old and worn her shoes were. Mm, they'll never do for a long journey, she thought. So she took them off and tried on the silver ones, which fitted her as well as if they'd been made for her. Then she picked up a basket. Come along, Toto, she said. We'll go to the Emerald City and ask the great wizard how to get back home again. Now, there were several roads nearby, but it didn't take her long to find the one paved with yellow brick. Within a short time, she was walking briskly towards the Emerald City, her silver shoes tinkling merrily on the hard yellow road. But when she'd gone several miles, she thought she'd stop to rest. So she climbed to the top of the fence beside the road and sat down. There was a great cornfield beyond the fence, and not far away, she saw a scarecrow set up high on a pole to keep the birds away from the ripe corn. Dorothy leaned her chin on her hand and gazed thoughtfully at the painted face of the scarecrow. And as she looked, one of the eyes slowly winked at her. Well, she thought she must have been mistaken at first, but then it winked again. And she climbed down from the fence and walked up to it, while Toto ran around the pole, barking. Good afternoon, said the scarecrow, in a rather husky voice. Oh, did you speak? asked Dorothy, very surprised. Certainly, answered the scarecrow. How do you do? Well, I'm pretty well, thank you, said Dorothy politely. How do you do? I'm not feeling well, said the scarecrow. It's boring being perched up here night and day, scaring away crows. Can't you get down? No, because this pole is stuck up my back. If you'll take it away, I should be very grateful. So Dorothy pulled away the stick from the sleeves of his coat. Then she gave a heave, and he shot off the pole and landed in a soft heap on the ground. Oh, thank you very much, said the scarecrow when he'd stretched himself. Hmm. Where are you going? Well, my name is Dorothy, and I'm going to the Emerald City to ask the great Wizard of Oz to send me back home. Where's the Emerald City, he said, and who's the Wizard of Oz? Well, don't you know? No, indeed, I don't know anything. You see, I, I'm stuffed, so I, I have no brains at all. Oh, said Dorothy, that, that's very sad. Do you think, he asked, if I went to the Emerald City with you that the great Oz would give me some brains. If you come with me, I'll ask him to do all he can for you. Thank you, he answered gratefully. How do we get there? Well, that's easy, said Dorothy. We just walk. Walk, said the scarecrow. I don't know how to walk. Well, it's very simple, she told him. First, move one leg, then the other. 
Well, the scarecrow tried, but as he was still sitting on the ground, it didn't do much good. <laughs> you have to stand up first, Dorothy said. Oh, I see, said the scarecrow, and got to his feet. Now first, lift one leg, said Dorothy, and the scarecrow did so. Now the other. Well, of course, as soon as the scarecrow lifted the other foot off the ground, he fell flat on his face. Well, it took a long time before Dorothy could get the scarecrow to walk properly, but eventually he got the hang of it, and they started to walk along the yellow brick road towards the Emerald City. Towards evening they came to a great forest where the trees grew so big and close together that their branches met over the road of yellow brick and made it very gloomy. And soon afterwards the scarecrow stopped. There's a little cottage, he said. It's, it's built of logs and branches. Shall we go in there? Yes, said Dorothy. I'm tired out. So the scarecrow led her through the trees till they reached the cottage. And Dorothy went in and found a bed of dried leaves in one corner. She lay down at once and with Toto beside her, soon fell into a sound sleep. But the scarecrow, having no brains, didn't get tired, so he stood in a corner waiting for the morning. And when Dorothy awoke, the sun was shining through the trees. She sat up, looked around her, and was very pleased to see that her friend, the scarecrow, didn't seem any the worse for spending the night standing up without sleep. Well, they left the cottage and were just walking through the trees towards the yellow brick road again, when they suddenly heard a deep groan nearby. <gasps> what was that? asked Dorothy timidly. I can't imagine, said the scarecrow, but I don't like the sound of it at all. Well, while they were wondering what to do, they heard another groan, and this time louder and it seemed to come from behind them. So Dorothy turned round and walked through the forest just a few steps, and suddenly she saw something shining in a ray of sunlight that fell between the trees. She ran towards it and then stopped short with a cry of surprise. One of the big trees had been partly chopped through, and standing beside it, with an uplifted axe in his hand, was a man made entirely of tin. His head and his arms and legs were jointed, but he stood perfectly still, didn't seem to be able to move at all. Well, Dorothy looked at him in amazement, so did the scarecrow, while Toto barked sharply and tried to snap at the tin legs till he hurt his teeth. Did you groan? Dorothy asked. Yes, answered the tin man. I did. I've been groaning for more than a year, but no one's heard me before. Well, Dorothy thought the man seemed very unhappy. Well, what can I do to help? she said. Get an oil can and oil my joints, he answered. They're rusted so badly I can't move them at all. If I'm well oiled, I shall soon be all right again. There's an oil can in my cottage. Well, Dorothy at once ran to the cottage where she found the oil can on a shelf and then hurried back. Where are your joints? she asked him. Oil my jaw first, replied the tin man, so she did. And after a great effort, he managed to open his jaw. Oh! Oh, that's better. Oh, that's better, he said. Now my neck, please. That was quite badly rusty, but eventually the tin man found he was able to turn his head from side to side. Oh, 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 oh yes. And now the joints in my arms and legs, he said. And Dorothy oiled them and the tin man bent them carefully. Mm. And it, oh, yeah, until they were quite free from rust and as good as new. Oh, I'd have stood there forever if you hadn't come along, he said, so you've saved my life. We're on our way to, to the Emerald City to see the great Oz, said Dorothy. Well, why do you want to see him? asked the Tin Man. I want him to send me back home, and the Scarecrow wants him to put a few brains into his head, Dorothy replied. Well, the Tin Man seemed to think deeply for a moment. Then he said... Do you suppose the Wizard of Oz could give me a heart? Well, I should think so, said Dorothy. It'd be just as easy as giving the Scarecrow brains. True, said the Tin Man. If you'll allow me to join you, I'll go to the Emerald City as well and ask Oz to help me. Of course, said the Scarecrow, and Dorothy added she'd be very pleased to have his company. So the Tin Man shouldered his axe and they all walked through the forest until they came to the road that was paved with yellow brick. And then suddenly, there was a terrible roar, and the next moment a great lion bounded into the road. 
With one blow of his paw, he sent the scarecrow spinning over and over, and then he struck the tin man with his sharp claw so that he clattered over and lay still. Little Toto, excited by the commotion, ran barking towards the lion, and the great beast opened his mouth to bite the dog, but just before he could do so, Dorothy rushed forward and slapped the lion on his nose as hard as she could. Don't you dare to bite Toto, she said. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. A great big beast like you biting a poor little dog. I didn't bite him, said the lion as he rubbed his nose with his paw where Dorothy just hit it. Maybe not, you tried to, she snapped. You're nothing but a great big coward. Uh, I know, said the lion, hanging his head in shame. I've always been a coward, but how could I help it? Well, I don't know, I'm sure. To think of you striking a stuffed man like a poor scarecrow. Is, oh, is he stuffed? No wonder he went over so easily. I was amazed to see him whirl around like that. Is, is the other one stuffed as well? No, said Dorothy. He's made of tin. Oh, that's why he nearly blunted my claws, said the lion. When they scratched against the tin, it made a cold shiver run down my back. Oh, what's that little creature you're holding? He is my dog, Toto, answered Dorothy. Is he made of tin or stuffed? asked the lion. Neither. He's an animal like yourself. Oh, is he? He's a curious animal. He seems remarkably small, now that I look at him. I mean, no one would think of biting such a little thing except a coward like me. And he looked very ashamed. Why are you a coward? Dorothy asked him. It's a mystery, said the lion. I suppose I was born that way. Oh, all the other animals in the forest naturally expect me to be brave because the lion is thought to be the king of the beasts. Well, I learned that if I roared very loudly, every living thing was frightened and got out of my way. Yes, but that isn't right. The king of the beasts shouldn't be a coward, said the scarecrow. I know, said the lion, wiping a tear from his eye with the tip of his tail. Made my life miserable. But whenever there's any danger, my heart begins to pound with fear. You ought to be glad, said the tin man. At least it proves you have a heart. Have you any brains? The scarecrow asked him. I suppose so. I've never looked to see. I'm going to the great Oz to ask him to give me some, replied the scarecrow, because my head is stuffed with straw. And I'm going to ask him to send Toto and me back home, added Dorothy. Do you think Oz could give me some courage? asked the lion. Just as easily as he could give me some brains, said the scarecrow. Then if you don't mind, I'll go with you. You see, my life is simply unbearable without a bit of courage. You'll be very welcome, answered Dorothy, and you'll help to keep away the other wild beasts. And so they set off again. <laughs> hardly been walking an hour when they came to a great ditch that crossed the road and seemed to cut the forest in two. The sides were so steep that none of them could climb down, and for a moment it seemed they could go no further. Now what shall we do? asked Dorothy in despair. I haven't the faintest idea, said the tin man, and the lion shook his shaggy mane and looked thoughtful. I think I could... I think I could jump over it. He said, then we're all right, answered the scarecrow. You can carry us all over on your back one at a time. Well, I'll, I'll try it, said the lion. Who'll go first? I will, said the scarecrow, because if you found you could not jump over the gulf, Dorothy would be killed, or the tin man would be badly dented on the rocks below, but it won't matter so much for me. The fall wouldn't hurt me at all. Well, what about me, said the lion? I'm terribly afraid of falling myself, but I suppose there's nothing I can do but to try it. Ooh, all right, jump on my back. So the scarecrow got up on the lion's back, and the big beast walked to the edge of the gulf and crouched down. Then, giving a great spring, he shot through the air and landed safely on the other side. They were all very pleased to see just how easily he did it, and after the scarecrow got down from his back, the lion sprang across the ditch again. Dorothy thought she'd go next. So she took Toto in her arms and climbed on the lion's back, holding tightly to his mane with one hand. And the next moment, it seemed as if she was flying through the air. And then, before she had time to think about it, she was safely on the other side. The lion went back a third time and got the tin man. And then, after he got his breath back, 
they started along the yellow brick road again and were pleased to see that the trees were getting thinner as they went. They walked along, listening to the singing of the brightly coloured birds and looking at the flowers which now became so thick that the ground was covered with them. There were big yellow and white and blue and purple blossoms and great clusters of scarlet poppies which were so brilliant they almost dazzled Dorothy's eyes. Aren't they beautiful, she said, as she breathed in the spicy scent of the flowers. I suppose so, answered the scarecrow. When I have brains, I shall probably like them better. Well, they came upon more and more of these big scarlet poppies and fewer and fewer of the other flowers. Now these poppies were magic and their scent was so powerful that anyone who breathed it fell asleep and couldn't ever be woken again unless they were moved away from the flowers. Well, Dorothy, of course, didn't know this. And soon her eyes closed in spite of herself and she forgot where she was and fell fast asleep among the poppies. What shall we do? asked the tin man. If we leave her here, she'll die, said the lion. The smell of the flowers is killing us all. <gasps> I myself can hardly keep my eyes open. Mm. And the dog's asleep already. It was true. Toto had fallen down beside his mistress, but the scarecrow and the tin man, not being made of flesh, weren't troubled by the scent of the flowers. Run fast said the scarecrow to the lion, and get away from these deadly flowers as soon as you can. We'll bring Dorothy with us, but if you fall asleep, you're too big to be carried. So the lion bounded forward as fast as he could go. In a moment, he was far out of sight. Let's make a chair with our hands and carry her, said the scarecrow. So they picked up Toto and put him in Dorothy's lap and carried the sleeping girl between them through the flowers. On and on they walked until at last they came upon their friend, the cowardly lion, lying fast asleep among the poppies. The flowers had been too strong for him, he'd given up at last, and fallen only a short distance from the end of the poppy field. Ah, we can do nothing for him, said the tin man sadly. He's much too heavy to lift. We must leave him here to sleep on forever. Perhaps he'll dream that he's found his courage at last. Oh, I'm sorry, said the scarecrow. The lion was a very good friend for one so cowardly. But we must go on if we're to save Dorothy and Toto. So they carried the sleeping girl to a pretty spot beside the river. She's very still, said the tin man. I hope she's all right. So do I, said the scarecrow. I'm very worried. She doesn't seem to be breathing at all. Do you think she'll ever wake up? And just then, they heard a low growl and they saw a strange beast come bounding towards them. It was a great, wild, yellow cat. Its ears were lying close to its head, its mouth was wide open, showing two rows of ugly teeth, and it had red eyes which glowed like balls of fire. As it came nearer, the tin man saw that it was chasing a little grey field mouse, and even though it had no heart, he knew it was wrong for the wild cat to try and kill such a pretty and harmless animal, so he raised his axe and frightened the beast so that it ran away, howling. The field mouse, seeing what had happened, stopped suddenly and said in a squeaky little voice, Oh, thank you. Thank you for saving my life. Don't mention it, said the tin man. I have no heart, you know, so I'm careful to help anyone who's in need of a friend, even if it happens to be only a mouse. Only a mouse? cried the little animal indignantly. Why, I am a queen, the queen of all the field mice. Oh, indeed, said the tin man, making a bow. At that moment, several mice came running up as fast as their legs could carry them. Oh, your majesty! Oh, your majesty! We thought you'd be killed! How did you manage to escape the great wild cat? They all asked in their twittering little voices. This funny tin man saved my life, the queen answered. So from now on, you must all serve him and obey his slightest wish. Oh, we will! cried all the mice in a shrill chorus. Is there anything we can do to repay you? said the queen. Nothing that I know of, answered the tin man. But the scarecrow said quickly, Oh yes, you can save our friend the cowardly lion who's asleep in the poppy field. A lion? cried the queen. He'll eat us all up. No, no, said the scarecrow. He'd never hurt anyone who's a friend of ours. Very well, said the queen. We will trust you. But what shall we do? Have you many subjects? asked the scarecrow. Oh yes, thousands. Then tell them all to come here as soon as possible and tell each one to bring a long piece of string. Well, the Queen turned to her courtiers and told them to do exactly as the Scarecrow asked. As soon as they heard her orders, they ran away in every direction as fast as they could. 
Now, said the scarecrow to the tin man, you must go to those trees by the riverside and make a truck that will carry the lion. Well, the tin man went at once and got to work so quickly that by the time the mice began to arrive, it was ready. Well, they came from all directions. There were thousands of them. Big mice, little mice, middle-sized mice, and each one brought a piece of string in its mouth. Well, the scarecrow and the tin man then got to work fixing one end of the string around the neck of each mouse and the other end to the truck. Well, of course, the truck was a thousand times bigger than any of the mice, but when they'd all been harnessed, they were able to pull it quite easily. Well, after a lot of hard work, for the lion was very heavy, they managed to get him up on the truck. Then the queen gave her people the order to start immediately, because she was afraid that if the mice stayed among the poppies too long, they'd fall asleep as well. At first, the little creatures could hardly move at all, but the tin man and the scarecrow both pushed the truck from behind, and that helped a lot. Soon they rolled the lion out of the poppy field and into the meadow, where he could breathe the sweet fresh air again instead of the poisonous scent of the flowers. Dorothy, who'd woken up by this time and was quite recovered, came to meet them and thanked the little mice very warmly for saving her friend from death. Then the scarecrow and the tin man unharnessed the mice from the truck and they scampered away through the grass to their homes. The queen was the last to leave. She handed Dorothy a tiny whistle. If you ever need us again, she said, blow this whistle and we will come and help you. And off she went. Well, it was some time before the cowardly lion woke up, but when he did open his eyes and roll off the truck, he was very glad to find himself still alive. When he was completely awake, they started off again. And after walking for about an hour, they saw a beautiful green glow in the sky just in front of them. Oh, oh that must be the Emerald City, Dorothy said. As the friends walked on, the green glow became brighter and it seemed that they were nearing the end of their journey at last. Yet it was afternoon before they came to the great sparkling wall that surrounded the city. In front of them, and at the end of the road of yellow brick, was a big gate, all studded with emeralds that glittered in the sun. There was a bell next to the gate. Dorothy pushed the button and heard a silvery, tinkling sound in the distance. Then the gate swung slowly open, and they all walked through and found themselves in a large room with a high ceiling which glistened with thousands of emeralds. Before them stood a man who was dressed in green from head to foot. He saluted them smartly. And what do you seek in the Emerald City? the gatekeeper asked. We came here to see the great wizard of Oz, said Dorothy. Well, the man was so surprised at this answer that he sat down to think it over. Well, many, many years since anyone asked to see Oz, he said. He's powerful and terrible, and if you bother him foolishly, he might be angry and destroy you all in an instant. Still, I am the guardian of the gates, and if you demand to see the great Oz, I must take you to his palace. But first you must put on the spectacles. Why? asked Dorothy. Because if you didn't, the brightness and glory of the Emerald City would blind you. Even those who live in the city have to wear spectacles all the time. They are locked on, and I have the only key that will unlock them. He opened a big box, and Dorothy saw that it was filled with green spectacles of every shape and size. The guardian of the gates found a pair for each of them. Then he locked them fast with the key and led the travellers through the streets until they came to a big building exactly in the middle of the city. This is the palace of Oz the Great Wizard, he said. He will grant you an audience, but each of you must enter his presence alone and he will only admit one each day. On the next day, soon after breakfast, Dorothy set off for the throne room of the Great Wizard. At the end of a long corridor, she opened a little door walked boldly through and found herself in a wonderful room. The walls and ceiling and floor were covered with large emeralds. But what interested Dorothy most was the great throne of green marble that stood in the middle of the room. It was shaped like a chair and, and sparkled with jewels like everything else, and on it sat a strange figure with a wise and solemn face, the great Wizard of Oz. Well, as Dorothy looked at him in wonder and fear, the eyes turned slowly and looked at her sharply and steadily. I am Oz the Great and Terrible, he said. Who are you and why do you seek me? Well, it wasn't such an awful voice as she'd expected, so she took courage and answered. I am Dorothy the Small and Meek, and I've come to you for help. Well, the eyes looked at her thoughtfully for a long time. Then the voice said, Where did you get the silver shoes that you are wearing? I got them from the Wicked Witch of the East when my house fell on her and killed her, she replied. 
And where did you get the mark on your forehead? That's where the Good Witch of the North kissed me when she said goodbye and sent me to you. What do you wish me to do? the wizard asked. Send me back home, please, where my Aunt Em and Uncle Henry are, she answered. Well, said the wizard, you have no right to expect me to send you back home unless you do something for me in return. Well, what must I do? Dorothy asked. Kill the Wicked Witch of the West, said the voice. Oh, but I can't. You kill the Witch of the East and you wear the silver shoes which bear a powerful charm, said the wizard. There is now only one Wicked Witch left in all this land and when you tell me that she is dead, I will send you back home, but not before. Dorothy left the throne room sadly and went back to where the lion and the scarecrow and the tin man were waiting to hear what Oz had said to her. It's impossible, she said. Oz will not send me home until I've killed the Wicked Witch of the West and I can never do that. The next morning the soldier with the green whiskers came to the scarecrow and said, Oz has sent for you, come with me. So the scarecrow followed him and was admitted into the great throne room where he found a strange figure with the face of a barn owl with glassy green eyes. It turned to him suddenly and said, Who? Oh, I am Oz the Great and Terrible. Who are you? And why do you seek me? Now the Scarecrow, who'd expected to see the great wizard that Dorothy had told him about, was astonished. But he answered bravely, I'm, I'm only a Scarecrow stuffed with straw, and I've come to you in the hope that you will put brains into my head. Why should I do this for you? The voice asked. Because you're wise and powerful and no one else can help me, the Scarecrow answered. I never grant favours without something in return, said Oz. But this I will promise. If you kill the Wicked Witch of the West for me, I will give you a lot of brains and such good ones that you will be the wisest man in the land of Oz. Now go. Oh. And the Scarecrow went sorrowfully back to his friends and told them about the strange figure and what it had said. The next morning, when the Tin Man entered the great throne room, he saw neither the wizard nor the owl. For Oz had changed himself again by magic and now appeared as a terrible beast. I am Oz the Great and Terrible, said the beast in a voice that was one great roar. Who are you and why do you seek me? I'm a man made of tin, so I have no heart and cannot love. I would like you to give me a heart so that I can be like other men. Oz gave a low growl at this. Uh, if you want a heart, you must earn it. Well, how? asked the Tin Man. The wizard rose to his feet. Help Dorothy to kill the Wicked Witch of the West, the beast replied. When the witch is dead, come to me again, and I will give you the biggest, kindest, and most loving heart in all the land of Oz. And the Tin Man returned sorrowfully to his friends and told them what the wizard had said. The next morning the lion went through the door and glancing around saw to his surprise that before the throne was a great sun with rays so fierce and glowing he could scarcely bear to look at them. He was so frightened his teeth began to chatter. A low, quiet voice came from the mouth of the sun. I am Oz the Great and Terrible. Who are you and why do you seek me? The lion answered, I I'm, I'm a cowardly lion afraid of everything. I've, c I've come to you to beg you to give me courage so that I may really become the king of the beasts. The sun shone fiercely for a time, then the voice said, Bring me proof that the wicked witch is dead, and I will give you courage. But as long as the witch lives, you must remain a coward. The lion was glad to find his friends waiting for him, and told him about his terrible interview. What shall we do now? he asked. There's only one thing we can do, said Dorothy, and that is to seek out the wicked witch and destroy her. Well, they found the soldier with the green whiskers and asked him to show them the way back to the gates of the city. He led them through the streets until they reached the room where the guardian of the gates lived. He unlocked their spectacles, put them back in his great box and then politely opened the gate. Which road leads to the Wicked Witch of the West? Dorothy asked. There is no road, answered the guardian of the gates, but keep to the west where the sun sets and you're bound to find her. And he saluted. Well, they turned towards the west, walking over fields of soft grass, dotted here and there with daisies and buttercups. And the Emerald City was soon left far behind. In the afternoon, it was so hot, with the sun shining into their faces, that Dorothy and Toto and the lion were soon tired and lay down on the grass and fell asleep, with the Tin Man and the Scarecrow keeping watch. 
Now the Wicked Witch of the West had only one eye, but she had a powerful telescope and could see everywhere. As she sat in the doorway of her castle, she happened to look around and saw Dorothy lying asleep with her friends all around her. And as she was a powerful witch, as well as a wicked one, she soon made up her mind what to do. In her cupboard there was a golden cap with a circle of diamonds and rubies all round it. Now this golden cap had a magic charm. Whoever owned it could call the winged monkeys who would obey any order they were given. With an evil smile, the wicked witch took the golden cap from her cupboard and put it on her head. Then she stood on her left foot and said slowly, Pepe, Pepe, Kake. Then she stood on her right foot and said, Hello, hollow, hello. After this, she stood on both feet, raised her arms and called out in a loud voice, Zizzy, Zuzzy, Zick. Now the charm began to work. The sky grew dark. A low rumbling sound was heard in the air. There was a rushing of wings and a great chattering and laughing. And the sun came out of a dark sky to show the wicked witch surrounded by a crowd of monkeys, each with a pair of powerful wings on his shoulders. One, much bigger than the others, seemed to be the leader. What do you command? Go to the strangers who are within my kingdom and bring them to me, hissed the witch. Your command shall be obeyed, said the leader. And then with a great deal of chattering and noise, the winged monkeys flew away to the place where Dorothy and her friends were. They seized the tin man and the lion and the scarecrow and they took them back to the witch's castle. There they were thrown into a dark cellar. They didn't hurt Dorothy at all. The leader of the winged monkeys flew up to her. His long, hairy arms stretched out and his ugly face grinning terribly. But then he saw the mark of the good witch's kiss on her forehead and he stopped suddenly. We dare not hurt this little girl, he said to the others, because she is protected by the power of good and that is greater than the power of evil. All we can do is to carry her to the castle of the wicked witch and leave her there. So, carefully and gently, they lifted Dorothy in their arms and carried her swiftly through the air until they came to the castle where they set her down on the front doorstep. Well, the wicked witch was surprised and worried when she saw the mark on Dorothy's forehead because she knew that neither the winged monkeys nor she herself dare hurt the girl in any way. She looked down at Dorothy's feet and seeing the silver shoes she began to tremble with fear for she knew what a powerful charm they had. But then she realised that the little girl didn't know about the wonderful power the silver shoes gave her. So she laughed to herself and she thought, I can still make her my slave, for she doesn't know how to use her power. And she made Dorothy clean the kettles and sweep the floor and keep the fire made up. And as the days wore on, Dorothy became very sad indeed because she realised how difficult it was going to be to get back home. Now the wicked witch longed to own the silver shoes, but she noticed that Dorothy never took them off so she had to think of a plan to trick her. Finally, she hit upon the very idea. She placed a bar of iron in the middle of the kitchen floor and made it invisible, so that when Dorothy walked across the room, she tripped over it and fell flat on her face. Well, she wasn't hurt very much, but as she fell, one of the silver shoes came off, and before she could reach it, the witch had snatched it away. Dorothy was so angry that she picked up a bucket of water that stood near and threw it over the witch, wetting her from head to foot. Instantly, the wicked woman gave a loud cry of fear, and then, as Dorothy looked at her in amazement, the witch began to shrink before her eyes. See what you've done, she screamed. In a few minutes, I shall have melted away and you'll have the castle to yourself. I know that I'd been wicked in my day, but I never thought a little girl like you would ever be able to melt me and end my wicked deeds. Oh, oh, look out, here I go. And with these words, the witch melted away to nothing. After picking up the silver shoe, which was all that was left of the old woman, Dorothy cleaned and dried it with a cloth and put it back on again. Then she took the witch's keys, ran down to the cellar and released the others. When they were reunited, Dorothy and her friends danced for joy. I can hardly believe it, said Dorothy. Now we can go back to the Wizard of Oz and claim his promise. Well, she went to the witch's cupboard to fill her basket with food for the journey and there she saw the golden cap. She tried it on her own head and found that it fitted her exactly. She didn't know anything about the magic charm of the golden cap, but she thought it was pretty, so she decided to wear it. 
and they all started for the Emerald City. Now, you remember that I told you there was no road, not even a pathway, between the castle of the Wicked Witch and the Emerald City. Well, of course, the travellers had been carried to the castle by the winged monkeys, but it was much harder to find their own way back through big fields of buttercups and yellow daisies. They knew, of course, that they must go to the east, towards the rising sun, and they started off in the right direction. But at midday, when the sun was over their heads, they didn't know which was east and which was west. And they all sat down on the grass and looked at each other. Dorothy was almost in tears, but then a bright idea came to her. Suppose we call the field mice, she said. They could probably tell us the way to the Emerald City. So she blew the little whistle that the queen of the mice had given to her. And in a few minutes, they heard the pattering of tiny feet, and hundreds of the small grey mice came running up. Among them was the queen herself, who asked, in her squeaky little voice, What can I do for my friends? We've lost our way, said Dorothy. Can you tell us where the Emerald City is? Certainly, answered the Queen. And then she noticed Dorothy's golden cap, and she said, Why don't you use the charm of the cap to call the winged monkeys to you? They will carry you to the City of Oz in no time. But I didn't know there was a charm, said Dorothy. It's written inside, replied the Queen. But if you're going to call the winged monkeys, we must run away, for they're full of mischief and think it great fun to tease us. But won't they hurt me? Oh, no. They have to obey the wearer of the cap. Goodbye. And she scampered out of sight with all the mice hurrying after her. Well, Dorothy looked inside the golden cap and saw some words written on the lining. She thought these must be the charm, so she read the directions carefully and put the cap on her head. Peppy, Peppy, Kaki. Hello, hollow, hello. Zizzy, Zuzzy, sick. For a moment, nothing happened. And then they heard a great chattering and a flapping of wings as the band of winged monkeys flew up to them. The king bowed low before Dorothy and asked, What is your command? We wish to go to the Emerald City, and we've lost our way, she replied. We will carry you, replied the king. And no sooner had he spoken than two of the monkeys caught Dorothy in their arms and flew away with her. Others took the scarecrow and the tin man and the lion and one little monkey seized Toto and flew after them. And in no time at all they looked down and they saw the green shining walls of the Emerald City in front of them. The strange animals set the travellers down carefully before the gate of the city. The king bowed low to Dorothy and then flew swiftly away, followed by all his band. And Dorothy and her friends made their way to the great throne room. They knocked at the door and walked in. They looked about and they saw no one at all in the room. And suddenly they heard a voice, which seemed to come from somewhere near the top of the great dome. I am Oz the Great and Terrible. Why do you seek me? We've come to claim our promises, O oh Oz, said Dorothy. Is the Wicked Witch really destroyed? asked the voice, and Dorothy thought that it trembled a little. Yes, she answered. I melted her with a bucket of water. Dear me, said the voice, Come back tomorrow, I must have time to think it over. You've had plenty of time already, said the Scarecrow. You must keep your promises to us, exclaimed Dorothy. Well, the lion thought it might be just as well to scare the wizard, so he gave a loud, frightening roar. <coughs> Toto was terrified and jumped away in alarm and tipped over a screen that stood in a corner. And the next moment they could hardly believe their eyes. In the corner, no longer hidden by the screen, stood a little old man with a bald head who seemed to be just as surprised as they were. The tin man raised his axe and rushed towards him and cried out, Who are you? I, I am Oz, the great and terrible, said the little man in a trembling voice. But don't strike me, please don't. I'll do anything you want me to. Well, everyone looked at him in surprise and dismay. Aren't you a great wizard? asked Dorothy. Hush, my dear, hush. Don't speak so loud, you'll be overheard. I should be ruined. I'm supposed to be a great wizard. And aren't you? she asked. Not a bit of it, my dear. I'm just a common man. You're more than that, said the Scarecrow in a grieved tone. You're a fraud. But I don't understand, said Dorothy in bewilderment. How was it that you appeared to me as a great wizard? Oh, that was one of my tricks, answered Oz. It was just a mask. I could look like an owl or a great beast or even like the sun quite easily by putting on different masks. 
I always thought it seemed a bit like showing off, said the Scarecrow. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Oh, I, I am, I certainly am, answered the little man sorrowfully. But it was the only thing I could do. If you listen for a moment, I'll tell you my story. I, I was born a long way from here, he said. And when I grew up, I became a ventriloquist. Well, after a time, I grew tired of that. I became a balloonist in a circus. Well, one day I went up in the balloon and the ropes got twisted so that I couldn't come down again. And for a day and a night, I travelled through the air. And on the morning of the second day, I woke up and found the balloon floating over a strange, beautiful country. It came down gradually and I, I, I wasn't a bit hurt. But I found myself in the midst of a strange people who, seeing me come from the clouds, thought I was a great wizard. So I ordered them to build this city and my palace. Then I thought, as the country was so green and beautiful, I would call it the Emerald City. And to make the name fit better, I put green spectacles on all the people so that everything they saw was green. Well, one of my greatest fears was the witches, so you can imagine how pleased I was when I heard that your house had fallen on the Wicked Witch of the East. Well, when you came to see me, I was willing to promise you anything, if only you'd do away with the other witch. Well, now that you've melted her, I'm ashamed to say that I can't keep my promise. But what about my brains? And how about my courage? And what about my heart? said the Tin Man. Well, the wizard thought for a moment then came to a decision. Very well, he said meekly. Come and see me tomorrow. I've played the wizard for so many years I may, may just as well continue the part a little longer. And what about me, said Dorothy? How am I to get back home? Well, we shall have to think about that, replied the little man. But when they'd gone, the wizard walked up and down, thinking. It took him so long he didn't notice he'd been thinking all night until he heard a knock at the door and found the scarecrow waiting for him. Good morning, said the Scarecrow. I've come for my brains. Oh, oh yes, yes. Is it, sit down in that chair, please, replied Oz. But you must excuse me for taking your head off, but I shall have to do it in order to put your brains in the proper place. That's all right, said the Scarecrow. So the wizard unfastened his head and emptied out the straw. Then he went into a back room and took up a handful of bran, which he mixed up with a great many pins and needles. He filled the top of the scarecrow's head with the mixture and stuffed the rest of the space with straw to hold it in place. But when he fastened the scarecrow's head on his body again, he said to him, From now on you will be a great man, for I have given you a lot of brand new brains. Well, the scarecrow was both pleased and proud at being granted his greatest wish, and having thanked Oz warmly, he went back to his friends. Then the tin man went to the throne room, knocked on the door and said, I've come for my heart. Oz brought a pair of scissors, cut a small square hole in the left side of the tin man's breast, then, going to a chest of drawers, took out a heart made entirely of silk stuffed with sawdust. Isn't it a beauty, he said. It is indeed, replied the tin man, but is it a kind heart? Oh, very, answered Oz. The heart seemed to flutter for a moment when Oz first put it into place, but then it started to beat as steadily as a watch. Gaboink, 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 gaboink. There, said the wizard, as he replaced the square of tin neatly. Now you have a heart that any man might be proud of. Well, next the lion went to the throne room and said nervously, I, I, I've come for my, my courage. Very well, answered the little man. I'll get it for you. He went to a cupboard. Reaching up to a high shelf, took down a square green bottle. Drink this, he said. Uh, what is it? asked the lion. Well, answered Oz, if it were inside you, it would be courage. You know, of course, that courage is always inside one, so that this really cannot be called courage until you've swallowed it. I advise you to drink it as soon as possible. The lion tasted it. Ugh, it was like very nasty medicine but he decided to make the best of it, and soon emptied the bottle. And, uh, how do you feel now? asked Oz. Full of courage, replied the lion, and he went joyfully back to his friends to tell them all about it. Well, for three days, Dorothy heard nothing from Oz, but on the fourth, to her great joy, he sent for her, and when she entered the throne room, said pleasantly, My dear, I think I've found the way to get you out of this country. Now, the first thing to do is to cross the desert, 
and then it should be easy. Well, how can I do that, she asked. Well, I'll tell you what I think, said the little man. I believe the best way will be through the air. Now, it's quite beyond my powers to make a cyclone, but I've made a great balloon of silk. We can fill it with hot air. We? exclaimed the girl. Uh, are you going with me? Oh, yes, replied Oz. I'm tired of being such a fraud. I'd much rather go back home with you and be in a circus again. Now we shall need a basket to ride in. And he sent the soldier with the green whiskers for a big clothes basket, which he fastened with many ropes to the bottom of the balloon. Then he ordered the balloon to be carried out in front of the palace, where the people gazed upon it in amazement. The tin man had chopped a big pile of wood, and now he set fire to it, and Oz held the bottom of the balloon over the fire so that the hot air that rose from it would be caught in the silken bag. Well, gradually, the balloon swelled out and rose into the air, until finally the basket just touched the ground. Then Oz got into the basket and said to the people in a loud voice, <coughs> I'm now going away to visit uh, another wizard. When I'm gone, the scarecrow will rule over you. I command you to obey him as you would me. The balloon was, by this time, tugging hard at the rope that held it to the ground. Come along, Dorothy, cried the wizard. Hurry up or the balloon will fly away. She was just a few steps from it when there was a gust of wind. Crack went the ropes and the balloon rose into the air without her. Come back, she shouted. I want to go too. I can't come back, my dear, called Oz from the basket. Oh, goodbye, 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 shouted everyone as they looked up to where the wizard was rising every moment farther into the sky. And that was the last any of them ever saw Boz, the wonderful wizard. Though he may have reached his home safely, and be there now for all I know. Well, next day the four travellers met in the throne room to talk things over. The scarecrow sat on the big throne and the others stood respectfully before him. They needed a plan to get Dorothy home. The scarecrow thought so hard that the pins and needles began to stick out of his brains. Finally, he said, why not use the magic cap? So she went and got it and handed it to the scarecrow, who used his new brains to read the spell. Epe, pepe, kake. Hello, holo, hello. Zizzy, zizzy, zick. Well, they all expected the winged monkeys to appear. But for a moment, nothing happened. Then the air filled with the sound of tinkling bells, and suddenly Glinda, the good witch of the south, stood before them. What can I do for you, my child? she asked. Well, Dorothy told the witch how the cyclone had brought her to the land of Oz, how she'd found her companions, and of the wonderful adventures they'd had, and how her greatest wish now was just to get back home. That is easy, said Glinda. Your silver shoes will carry you over the desert. All you have to do is to knock the heels together three times and command the shoes to take you wherever you wish to go. Well, if that's so, said Dorothy, I'll ask them to take me home immediately. She threw her arms round the lion's neck and kissed him, patting his big head tenderly. Then she kissed the tin man, who was weeping in a way that threatened his joints. But when she hugged the soft, stuffed body of the scarecrow, she found that she herself was crying. Then she took Toto in her arms, and having said one last goodbye, she clapped the heels of her shoes together three times, saying, Take me home to Aunt Em. Instantly she was whirling through the air so swiftly that all she could see or feel was the wind whistling past her ears. And when she stopped spinning at last, she could hardly believe her eyes, but she was sitting on the grass, and just in front of her was the new farmhouse Uncle Henry had built after the storm had carried away the old one. The door opened and Aunt Em came out of the house. She looked up and saw Dorothy running towards her. My darling child, she cried, where in the world did you come from? From the land of Oz, said Dorothy. I've had a wonderful time and I've had lots of adventures, but... Oh, Aunt Em, I'm so glad to be home again. Thank you.